on a long, lonesome journey I'm going. Now, darling, please don't cry for these shackles and chains. They will take me to a prison to stay till I die. Hello, I'm Lisa Tenner, and I'm so excited today because I'm here with Jacqueline Machard, who is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 22 novels for adults and teenagers, and the recipient of Great Britain's Talk About Prize, the Bram Stoker and Shirley Jackson Awards, and she was named to the shortlist for the Women's Prize for Fiction. Her first book, The Deep End of the Ocean, was the inaugural selection for Oprah's book club. And it has more than 3 million copies sold and is in print in 34 languages. It was later adapted into a major film. And now Jackie has a wonderful novel out. It is actually my favorite of all her novels. It's called The Good Son, and you have got to read it. And I'm so thrilled to be here with Jackie today for two reasons. One is she is one of my favorite authors. And the other is that I love fiction. Because I'm a book coach for nonfiction, my my fun time <laughs> is often spent reading novels. And, and one day, actually, I think I am going to eventually write a novel. And Jackie, you are going to be my mentor and editor if you'll have me. So yes, welcome, absolutely. Jackie. Absolutely. That's a guarantee <laughs> for you. I, oh. um, I was just going to say that, that I'll be there for you because every uh, new fiction writer, no matter how wonderful and experienced that person is, needs a code and mm -hmm. needs a, a mentor because it um for some reason the muscles that we put into things for other people don't necessarily translate into the muscles that we use for ourselves mm -hmm. yeah i think that's very true and fiction is different from nonfiction. there there i i see it as as more challenging Do i don't you know really you, yeah wow wow oh wow see to me, having to follow the rules and actually stick to what happened in true life is much more challenging because I think of my I think of fiction as a way to correct life. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, I can see that. I think especially with memoir writing, uh, you know, you can't change what happened. And so it is trickier if you, you know, gee, this part's not as interesting, but you know, it might be hard to find a way to make it interesting. Do I even keep it in the book? Whereas with fiction, you can always up the ante with everything, right? Well, indeed. And that uh, I'm not um, suggesting that we talk about this book, but The Good Son is based on something that really happened, not to me, but mm -hmm. to someone who told me about it. And my empathy for her and my wish that I could change what had happened to her was so great that for years I carried this inspiration around in my head until I finally convinced my agent to let me write this novel. He was about 79 and a half percent against my doing that because he wow. said these characters could never be sympathetic. Wow. Wow. Well, these characters are extremely sympathetic. And uh, I, I wondered about that too, just emotionally, how invested do you get in your characters? Like, are you feeling their pain all the time while you're writing or how does that work? I don't think of them as real. My All my uh -huh. friends do. All my fiction yeah. writing friends, they talk to their characters, their characters talk to each other, their characters tell them what they want to do. And I think that if I had that going on, I might want some medicine or yeah. something. Well, because I, you go so deep. Well, true. And also it, I mean, I am the boss of them. I, ha, I made them up. And when they 
if I left them to their own devices and they talk to each other, I think they would say to each other, here's what we'll do. We'll just open up a bag of Doritos and sit on the couch. And <laughs> it wouldn't do anything. No, there would be no introspection. There would be no action. They would just be sitting there. So I have to get them. I have to kick them and get them into motion. And sometimes I get in trouble because I put them in a little too much motion and I have to draw back on that. Wow. Well, well, I, I, you really do masterfully put them into motion. And, you know, I, I, I can't put your books down. I'm staying up like way too late until I finish them. Uh, but I'd love to hear some more about that process and especially early on. So you, you had some of this book going on in your head for years that you were thinking about this story. What was that like? How much of the book sort of did you work on in your head before you started writing? Before I ever write a single sentence, I know in a general way what the book will comprise. I know I don't, uh, and I don't believe this, Edgar Doctorow famously said that when you're writing a novel, all you need, it's like driving across country in a fog. You know the old quote, all you need to be able to see is what's directly in front of the car, but that's enough to keep you from crashing and uh, to get you all the way across the country. I don't really believe that he did that because uh, you couldn't write a novel like Ragtime, okay? Um, uh -huh. By, you know, just being able to see what was in front of the car uh, and intertwining real characters with uh, and real events with fictional events and all that sort of thing. You couldn't do that. But I need to be able to see all the way to California when uh -huh. I start off from Boston. It just as I would not go to the airport and say, okay, I'll just get a ticket. And <laughs> wherever I turn up, that's fine. I need to know exactly where I'm going and in a general way how I'm going to get there. However, that does change. I mean, it changes as... Uh, the characters are put into action and interacting with each other and uh, the events are overtaking them or blocking their progress. But I think that I know the end of every story before I start it. And in a sense, the writing of the book is the progress toward that end. Mm -hmm. And then how about backstory of the characters? Do you think a lot about their backstory? Do you write a backstory? I don't, I don't literally write it down. I have done that in my life. It mm -hmm. got in the way in the sense that I would write things down in the, in my uh, moleskin notebooks and then lose the notebooks and, and spend you know, hours rampaging through the house looking for that particular <laughs> note. Uh -huh. but, um, but in a general way, I, I believe that I know them. And just as someone said, and I can't remember who it was, but it was recent, that every character in, if you write a film, every mm -hmm. character in that film is you, but you're also the director and the storyteller. So each of them comprises some aspect of my character for my mm -hmm. own human character for good or ill. And so I'm invested in making that, uh, making that understood part of me a part of their lives. But also I like to have fun with my past and fun with the things that I know. For example, Thea, the main character uh -huh. in this story, is uh, Greek American. Okay, and I grew up with uh, a family across the street from my grandparents who were Greek Americans, and have always, in a way, I was able to by writing about Thea and her sisters and the foods that they ate and the things that they did. I was able to reunite with that family. Uh huh. Oh, that's beautiful. So let, let's really dig into The Good Son. And it begins with a mother, and she's about to pick up her son from prison. He's getting out of prison for, uh, for the murder of the love of his life, his high school sweetheart, a crime that he doesn't remember. 
and we witness how the community responds to the son's return and to his parents, the mother and father. And we see the mom especially struggling to come to terms with her fierce love of her son and this heinous crime and all the fallout. So can you share with our listeners um, that actual moment in the coffee house that first inspired this novel? Well, I was at a hotel. I was waiting for my coffee. I was going to speak at this big writers conference mm -hmm. and I was waiting in line and the woman in front of me dropped her book and I picked it up and handed it back to her. And having the personality, at least in public, of a golden retriever, I said, oh, are you here for the, you know, are you here for the conference? And she said, no, I'm not. I'm here to visit my son. I come every weekend. He's in prison and he'll be in prison for a long time. And I thought, oh, why did I ask? Don't tell me what he's in prison for. Mm -hmm. But she did. And I could not turn away from her. I was in one sense fascinated by her because she was, this is in the nature of confession. I thought I would understand what a woman who had a son in prison for murder would look like. Mm -hmm. And she looked just like me. Right. And so there was an enormous outrush of empathy from me to her. Mm -hmm. And when she told me of this one incident in which she had gone to the grave of the girl that her son killed, and he had no memory of the crime either because he was so messed up on wow. methamphetamine wow. that um and the mother of the girl showed up at the cemetery at the same time oh. and she was terrified the mother of the boy was terrified but the two women who had been friends in the past ended up crying in each other's arms and the mother of the girl who died who was killed said you are luckier because at least you can still touch him. Mm -hmm. And that scene in a sense is in, it's very much changed, but there's mm -hmm. a scene like that in the good son. I mean, it explodes into a lot of different kind of drama, but yeah. it, um, but it, it's in there because you think not only of, you think of, of death as the end, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's really the beginning of your life without your child or without your spouse. It is uh, both an end and the beginning of a future that you could have never imagined. Wow. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's such a profound journey, this book. And um, I wonder too, you know, certainly it seems like some of the themes that you that you want us to think about as readers are redemption and are um both i think the personal aspects of this story and and the community aspects of it uh, because it really is about you know personal and family and then community as well D did you have any sort of like this is what i want readers to come away with or this is what uh, you know there's also the theme about prisons and how how um, inhumane they are. Uh, d like, did, did you have sort of a, a goal in mind about like, I want readers to be thinking about this or, or anything like that, or I want to raise awareness? Not in that, not in those words, but always I want to be able to, my goal with every book is I want to make you laugh. I want to make you cry. I want to make you think, and I don't want you to hate yourself in the morning for this. Oh, that's beautiful. And so, and so those are, are my goals going into every story. And certainly I needed to find out, I needed to talk to people who had experienced having a child who was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And I needed to talk to them about the way that, I mean, I had been in prisons as a reporter when I was much younger and even visiting a prison, no matter, even if it's a minimum security prison is a harrowing experience. Mm -hmm. When the door shuts behind you, you think, 
I didn't do anything wrong and I'm still here. It's, uh, it's, a, it, it's a terrible and harrowing experience. And so I wanted to convey that. And Stefan, the, the son, the good son, uh, his experience in prison is not even a patch on some experiences that other people have, though I will say that there is a tradition in prison populations that the people who get the worst treatment are the ones who hurt a woman or a child. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, operational there. And he had to arm himself with the skills that he could give people, uh, such as teaching them to read and, uh, and helping them get their GEDs and things like that, so that he could mit mitigate some of those uh, feelings, the, the, the sort of uh, honor, among, honor among miscreants or honor among mm -hmm. thieves that, mm -hmm. uh, that the, his fellow prisoners had toward him. Mm -hmm. and, and how many people did you interview or how'd you find them? I, ha I knew there was a woman who said she had a friend. And Lisa, I don't know whether this woman was lying or whether she lived on Mars, that, that <laughs> the covenant was that I could not use her real name, but I could, you know, you can tell when people are telling the truth. Yeah. So you, if you live long enough in the world and if you have a child or something like that, you can tell when people are on the level and when they aren't. And mm -hmm. I could tell that her experience was genuine and that it was difficult for her to talk to me about it. So oh, I so she told you it was a friend, but it was herself. Yes. Wow. And there were only, uh, I only interviewed two people. And, but I interviewed them at length and their, uh, experiences were remarkably similar wow. because one of them, um, came from one, one of the, uh, women, the mothers came from a background in which really it was only a matter of time before mm -hmm. her son did something wrong. He, uh, going to prison in her community uh, especially when she was younger, was a sort of status symbol. Wow. Okay, doing a bid in prison was sort of a status symbol. The other woman I interviewed was much more like Thea, in which <laughs> this just completely came from, uh, seemingly came from no place. And the parents tormented themselves not only with the absence of their child, but also with what did we do wrong? What did we do wrong? How, we, you know, we only thought that we were raising him to be like us, as all parents do, mm -hmm. with a reasonable expectation of some kind of health and happiness. And I don't know which, frankly, and if you think about it, tell me what you think. I don't know which person it's harder for. The one who expects it to happen, the one who never expects it to happen. I don't know. I think it must be the same. Yeah, I, I think the the pain is so extreme and the struggle must be so extreme that uh, no, you can't prepare yourself for it, right? Right. Um, but uh, along the lines of research, so Stefan becomes a landscaper, and I just wondered, you know, are you a gardener? Is that where um, is that where uh, you drew upon uh, that experience to for Stefan's? career that he finds for himself or um how does uh or did you have to do research for that too i did i uh had to do research i hate the good earth i um i write about the ocean all the time but i'm afraid of it you know i i it's i would i would never plant anything if it was up to me and so i try to recruit my children and uh, other people to plant things for me with different <laughs> degrees of success. And our <laughs> vegetable garden usually produces one eggplant uh, and that's it for the whole year. I like the idea. It's like so many other things. I like the idea of myself at the ocean with the wind in my hair and walking on the sand, but I hate the sand. I hate the ocean. 
And even though I live on Cape Cod and I also can't stand gardening, though I want the vegetables. It's um, so I, I actually a, a woman I know, a great friend of mine who also is a novelist was dating an absolutely horrible fellow who had an absolutely wonderful company and that he did, um, he did landscaping with plants in a really ornamental way that was very uh, fetching. And he did it for corporations as Stefan does. And he did it for individuals elaborately and, uh, and seasonally. And so I drew all the inspiration from that because I was just fascinated by the idea of that kind of company. So Jackie, I think you could have a, a new like self-help movement on how to experience anything that you've sort of wanted to, but it's like way too tough and you really don't want to do the details is just to become a fiction writer and you could just imagine it and never have to actually do it and make it so much more fun and easy <laughs> by just doing it in a novel. <laughs> and you can also, it's like buying hand weights, you know, you buy them, you put them in your bedroom and that's what you do. <laughs> Right, right. And you, you are a virtual weightlifter then. Yeah, except you get to actually experience the thrill of it by writing it, which is which is such True. a fascinating thing. I love it. Um, True. So does each book teach you something different? And if so, what did the good son teach you? The most important thing that it taught me is, of course, I tried to place myself um, emotionally mm -hmm. in the, in Thea's position. I tried to think of, I have five sons and I tried to think of one of my best beloved, you know, uh, mm -hmm. having done the worst possible thing. And could I go on loving him? Mm -hmm. And once I was at a writer's residence in Chicago and when I was planning just at the beginning of this book, and there was an assembled group of right mothers and fathers there uh and some single women uh and i asked the group at large how do you think you could go on loving your child knowing what your child had done and accepting the truth of it mm -hmm. to a person they said yes yeah i was stunned by that but then i also watched a ted talk by sue klebold who was the mother, who is the mother of Dylan Klebold, one of the Columbine shooters. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that people in the audience were blown back by her frank confession that of course she still loved her son. She loved the child that had been caged inside the heartless killer, the, the child who she raised. She loved that child still and she wished she was with him. She wished he was with her. And, uh, and I understood that completely and mm -hmm. whether that, because sometimes human nature contravenes good sense and love certainly does. And so I guess that is the thing that I took away from the good son, because in every aspect of each of these characters, the incredible tenacity of love is astounding. I think that's one thing that you do so well in in so many of your novels is that we we learn that there there's such a degree of empathy we have for people we might not have thought we'd have empathy for. And uh we learn something about ourselves I think as human beings and what we're capable of but also we learn about other people when when we read good fiction. We absolutely do. I think of my first novel, uh, The Deep End of the Ocean, in which um, people just absolutely hated Beth Capadora, who had, because of her tragedy and losing her child who was kidnapped, uh, become distant and withdrawn and hard bitten, mm -hmm. as depressed people do sometimes. And she did not become noble because of tragedy. And she did mm -hmm. not become more of a light in other people's lives. And while 
some people said they didn't like her. Many people said they couldn't help but love her because she was doing the thing. She was living the nightmare and doing her best to stay alive. And that was all that she could do. And so sometimes I want to write, of course, we don't write about uh, how it was to have a great vacation in a novel. Okay. We write about people pushed to their absolute extremes and then try to explain their behavior and try Mm -hmm. to their behavior. So, so let's talk a little about the deep end of the ocean, your, your first book. Uh, and it was the inaugural pick for the, for Oprah's book club, which must've been extraordinary. I kind of wondered, did she just say, did she read the book and say, oh, now I have to have a book club? Yes. (laughs) Yes. She had, she loves books. Okay. She always Uh has books and she sort of thinks of authors as the way other people think of rock singers, rock stars. Mm -hmm. And she had tried in many different ways to feature fiction on her show, but it was voyage to the bottom of the ratings. You know, people just, Mm -hmm. you know, until the book club movement, if you will, started at the end of the Mm nineties. And she thought clever creature that she is, I'm going to have the largest book club in the world. And I'm going to start it with this novel, which her boyfriend Stetman had brought home to her from the, from the corner store in Indiana and said, here, why don't you read this? Okay. So she did. And she said that the authenticity of the grief was what drew her to that story, how harrowing it was and how she kept on reading, even though she wanted to throw the book across the room because it was so painful to read. Wow. And, uh, and what my publisher said, and this is important, when I said, oh, Oprah Winfrey's going to start this book club and start it with the deep end of the ocean, they said, oh, well, that's all well and fine. But these are antithetical media. And so people who read books don't watch daytime TV, so it's not going to have a big effect on the book. Okay. Well, I still said, okay, it'll be great. I went to Chicago and we had a dinner party and ate baby carrots and stuff like that. And uh, (laughs) by the next day after that broadcast, there were 4,000 holds on the book at the New York Public Library alone. (laughs) Wow. So really, you know, it was like Bruno Mars uh, said, what's up, Oprah? She knew something. that nobody else knew, which was that people had a hunger and thirst. The book club experience really is a gossip experience. It's gossiping about books, what stories are for. I love that. So so what was your preparation for this book? You were a journalist and had you always wanted to write a novel? Had you been working on some novels on and off? Like what was the journey before writing that book? Well, the the, what I wanted to do was prove to myself and my children at that time, I had four young children and I was a new widow. Okay. That there was life after death. I wanted to try Mm -hmm. something that I knew would be impossible for me. I had never written any fiction since the freshman one semester elective at the university of Illinois in Champaign. And I never imagined myself writing fiction, but I knew about grief. And I wondered what would be the the worst thing that could happen to a person. And it would be that uh, you were bereft of the person you loved most, of your your best beloved, and never knew why, never knew the reason for it. Mm -hmm. And I was also inspired by a real life story that happened, I think when I was in high school, uh, to a kid called Jacob Wetterling, who was kidnapped and then returned to it. He was kidnapped and held for years by a pedophile who treated him both as a sexual object and as a a son, if you will, a child of his. And then he returned to his family after 13 years and his life was unimaginable, 
even though um, the 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 family's dream had come true, mm-hmm. as Saint Teresa said, you know there are more tears shed from answered prayers than unanswered prayers, and his life was harrowing and it was short. He uh, was killed in a motorcycle accident when he was only twenty four, and they lost him all over again. But I thought about that story. I thought about what if the beginning of the story was the end of most people's stories. Wow. And so it sounds like there was a real healing um, healing instinct to write that book, that, that, that it really came from your own healing process. It did. I really wanted to do something that would prove to me that uh, that there would be, you know, I was 38 or something like that, and that there mm-hmm. the back 40 would have something uh, to hold for me. Mm-hmm. And I never expected the success of that book. I knew it was good. I did know yeah. it was good. And I, but I didn't expect it would be this huge bestseller and all this kind of thing. And, um, but I knew that it was good enough to get published. And that was really all I knew at that point. Yeah. Wow. And then when it succeeded so, so much, so, so well, I had the privilege of telling those imaginary stories for a living sort of, or as part of my living, uh, on and off through the years, it's either part of it or all of it. And, uh, and uh, every single one of them, every single novel was based on real life on something that mm-hmm. happened in real life. I know, you know, you can't really make anything up. Right. Right. Well, it seems to me you, ha- you do have this uncanny, uh, ability to see a story and things and to see really extraordinary stories in what's around you. Um, my mentor, my mentor was a science fiction writer. Okay. Oh. A great science fiction writer. And I don't even read science fiction. Okay. Uh-huh. For, he was my friend for 30 years after I wrote him a fangirl letter when I was in my twenties. And he told me that, um, it, the uh, it, he his name is Ray Bradbury. You know who Ray Bradbury is. Yes. Wow. Right. So, uh, the Martian Chronicles, for example, was much less about Mars than it was about <laughs> human emotions. That everything was about human emotions at mm-hmm. the end of the day. And I think that that was advice I carried forward into my own life. It doesn't, it matters what happens in a story, but unless you're writing, and even then, uh, even if you're writing a breakneck action thriller spy story or something Mm -hmm. like that, the effect on people of those choices Mm -hmm. is what really matters, is what really counts. That makes so much sense. So, so speaking about mentors, you know, you got this idea for the, for the deep end of the ocean and did you enroll in a class? Did you read about writing fiction? Did you just map it out and then write it? Uh, and then what was the role of any editors or, or Ray Bradbury or anybody else to support you in this process? How did that work? Well, I, I had never, no, I didn't have any, there were, this is a long time ago, you know, this Mm -hmm. is 25 years ago, almost. And it was, there, there weren't just, not 25 years ago, but close enough. There weren't a proliferation of classes in how to write fiction Mm -hmm. or role in the world as a book coach that would have been entirely unknown. That was invented in, in this in the last 10 or so years when people have far too many people, I might add, believe that they should write a book and no offense to your clientele, but those are all no. competition for, those are all competition for me and they should just go work on their abs or something like that instead of writing <laughs> it. Um, but I, uh, I had gone to the University of Reading Everything 
And well, that's so, a great university. <laughs> that was, I based my story on the stories that I had read. I based the way to tell this story mm-hmm. on the ways that people, my betters, had read. And as a matter of fact, um, when my sons were little then, okay, they were nine, six, and three when I started this. And uh, when they got older, uh, I would read to them at night, but because I was bored by most of what was offered for them to read, I would read to them from books that I liked. And one of my favorite books is called National Velvet. It's about a girl and a horse, and it's a million years old and it took place in England um, in the 30s. And my son, Dan, who is a truth speaker, said to me one time, you know, this writer really copied you a lot, mom. You know, <laughs> like, what so, a great line. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he recognized how much the way that she told the story had been, I had internalized it into my own mo- molecules. But okay. I think of that homage, that we're drawn to the authors that we're drawn to because the way that they do things, the stories they tell and the way that they tell them speaks to something in our own condition. And so there's a reason that, and I tell my students, I tell my MFA students, don't literally copy their sentences, but um, but copy the way that they do things. I mean, that's what Picasso did. That's what Matisse did, that, that they copied the old masters and the way that they did things until that became part of their own voices, their own art. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things you teach your MFA students? Um, I I mean, I know you take, you know, uh, a whole semester to teach a class, but just um, a few tidbits. If a, if I had a t-shirt for them, it would be, it would say, like um, like Salieri said to Mozart, except it wouldn't say notes, it would say words. There are too many damn words in this, you have to take some of them out. And it would just say, be simple. Look mm-hmm. at the writers that you admire and how simply they tell a story. They find exactly the right words instead of using 52 of them. Mm-hmm. And so I guess that I would say, this is not the kitchen sink. Don't throw, this may, may be the only book you ever write, or it may not be the only book you ever write, but there's still not to, uh, no reason to tell everything you know. You don't have to tell everything that you know, just some of it, just some of it, just what really goes into the story. And I don't think there's any better advice for any writer not just a beginning writer, but any writer, than to pare back your writing to its absolute essence. Wouldn't you agree with that? I, I would. And you know, one of my teachers at MIT actually was Frank Conroy, the year that he was the director of the National Endowment for Arts and Literature. And the year before he went to become the executive director of uh, the Iowa Writers Workshop. Yeah. And he talked about a professor of his who used to, you'd hand in your papers and Professor would just tear off the first two or three pages and throw them in the garbage without reading them. And then he'd read your paper. So, you know, that's sort of an extreme form of it. But, you know, that image really got to me of, okay, you know, be prepared to just get rid of the beginnings of things. Uh, Not always, but but often uh, you're just leading up to it. You're just finding your way into it sometimes. That's exactly right. And oft times what you're doing is, for example, with a prologue, okay, with a prologue in a book, the reason that editors hate prologues is what the prologue really is doing is saying to the reader, okay, this isn't what happens. This is what you should think about what happens before I tell you what happens. And so there is often a good reason just to discard your initial uh, beginning Uh, or what you discard everything that you think the reader should know and tell the reader what the reader wants to know, which is what's going on in the kitchen. 
What are people saying to each other? Why are they angry with each other? You don't have to tell them why that matters. That will become mm -hmm. self-evident. Right, right. So so did you just start um, with the deep end of the ocean? Did you just start on your own, write the book, and then find an editor or mentor? Or how did that work? I wrote the book on my own. I had written a very forgettable uh, nonfiction book in my 20s. It sold briskly among people with the same last name as my own, which <laughs> was almost no one in the world. Uh -huh. And uh, and my agent kept saying to me, you should write a novel. You should write a novel. How did I do that? I was a newspaper reporter. I had no idea how to write a novel. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, inspired by this story of the boy who had returned home to his family after, uh, after being captive for all those, for nine or 10 years, I decided to try it and I wrote the first hundred pages and okay at this time there were not computer files right mm -hmm. so my agent said to me here take this back double space the first hundred oh. pages so it looks like there's more of it i yeah. said okay and i did and she sold it right away in part because of again that often the shock and and grief mm -hmm. in the story and the belief that that was authentic, but I just wrote it. I, I had no, I had no, uh, mentor until much later. I mm -hmm. had no instruction in it. I was just following. I was standing on the shoulders of people who did it better than I did. My favorite book then is the same as my favorite book. Now it's the same book, which is called the tree grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. Oh, wow. And that to me, if I could write a novel, like that had as much to do with life and art and just simply growing up in the world through difficulties, that would be my goal. So I, I followed the way that the beautiful natural way that she told that story to the degree that I could. Mm -hmm. So when I read a novel, I do become so immersed in it. I am not really aware of what the author is doing or doing well. You know, it's just like, there I am in the story reading. And I think maybe I've been like a little too lazy to go back and figure out what, what how did this author do it? But is, is that something you'd advise? Like go back and really try to figure out how they did it? Or, do, or is your sense that, look, if you just read a ton, you, you'll just absorb that somehow? It depends on if you want to be a writer or not. If you are doing this, if you're reading in part for enjoyment and, and love of story, but also because you would like to do that yourself, it's probably useful to think about the ways that people chose to do things mm -hmm. and whether they, whether they work out or not. Some ways are just cheesy, like uh -huh. in, a, in a thriller sometimes uh, at the end of every chapter, the writer will say, and then she realized that she still didn't know why he was lying or something, something. And of course, as a, as a reader, you have to go on and find out why she didn't, why no one knew whether the person was lying or not. But in, in the, the idea is to do it, to seed all of the things that the reader needs to know into the first chapter. Mm -hmm. So that at the end of the book, the, if you notice, um, and I won't say why, because it's, it's interesting, I hope, uh, the good son begins and ends at a prison, right? Mm -hmm. It comes entirely around full circle to the place where it began, but for wildly different reasons. And so you're making a promise to the reader in those first pages. There's a reason why I started this here. And it mm -hmm. isn't just because it's the homecoming of this boy. And it, it, there's a reason why I started here. And if you stick with me, I'm gonna tell you what the reason is. And you're gonna learn it organically 
through the progress that the story makes. There's a reason for each of these choices because every, every sentence, paragraph, plot twist in a story is a choice that has to be earned. And it has to do weightlifting, like those barbells in my room that are just sitting there. That mm-hmm. they, they have to, they have to, it has to be able to bear weight. And so many times what some of the things my MFA students say to me is, well, I base this on the story of my grandparents moving to the United States from Germany, and this is the way it really happened. No, you can't. The way it really happened is the worst possible reason to do something in fiction. There has to be, there has to be another reason for a plot reason, a uh, an eventual effect reason that you're holding in your mind as you plot this book uh, for including anything. That makes so much sense. And I feel like, Jackie, I have learned so much in this time we just spent together about writing and writing fiction. So I'm, I'm very grateful. I feel like I've been sitting at the feet of Master and soaking it up. Uh, and is there anything else you want to share with our with our listeners who many of whom are some of them are writing fiction, many of them write nonfiction. Any any last words of wisdom you want to share with them? Well, you're going to think this the first part is cheesy. OK, OK. One is pay attention to Lisa Tenner because you teach people about this process better than almost anybody your your books are a university of how to tell a story and why to tell a story and what to leave in and what to take out that part is definitely true and i admire that enormously and i realize i sound like a brown nose but i don't care um the other part is it when you uh, when you approach a story try to imagine you're that you're not people always say i write this for myself and i don't really care whether it gets published or whether who reads it well that is just such a big lie we all care enormously whether our you know we we either don't want anyone to read our stories or we want someone to start a religion about us you know or something like that <laughs> so, you hey, enormous it, we're enormously invested in um in having the things that the stories we tell have an effect on other people so admit that and try to think of the way that your story is going to have an effect on a reader because a story really isn't a story until the reader takes your hand until someone hears that story oh that is that is so beautiful And uh, thank you. You have been such a generous teacher in this interview, and you are such a generous author. You give your readers so much, and I'm so grateful for your books. And I encourage all our listeners, go out and buy The Good Son and read it. You'll read it quickly because it just captivates you. And uh, thank Thank you you again, Jackie. Good luck with the book. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Put your arms through the bars once, my darling. Let me kiss those sweet lips that I love best. For in heartache, you're my consolation.